just got out of one of Connie's presentations about the, the correlation between the ERG and uh, results on the water. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to do, how to uh, you know, combine a little bit um, biomechanical information uh, with strength and conditioning and how can we improve the training that we're doing with our young people. Um, Connie, as you know, this whole conference is built around the American developmental model, which in Canada they, is just long-term athlete development, right? Isvan uh, Bali in 1986 came up with it and the, the, all the world uses it. Uh, we're just catching up. So um, this is about junior rowing and, and how to mix the two. So again, thank you for being here and um, I'll give you the floor. Okay, thank you. And thanks for everyone to listen in to the second talk um, of the day. So um, uh, the topic um, we talk about today is sort of comes right to my heart because I think the area where I work in, you know, and that is objective assessment of athletes performance and athletes technique and how we can sort of build and assist athletes to become um, you know, sort of more stronger and more robust athletes and with it, you better movers and better rowers, I think um, cannot just be seen um, one dimensional. If I think of my area, my area of biomechanics really only is relevant once we apply it with um, the different areas of coaching and when we say coaching, coaching on water as well as off water and off water, the one topic we had already that's the ergometer rowing. And then obviously the other part is strength and conditioning uh, training of our athletes. And in this case, we would think um, the, especially when we think of strength and conditioning is not just building, you know, power it's it's about flexibility agility movement you know lightness how do i sequence so there are so many factors where you can make a difference with your athletes of water that would transfer beautifully um, towards on water rowing and um, especially rowing as a sport Sport, as a team sport is quite unique because when you think of any team sport, uh, rugby or AFL or in uh, American football, in your case, soccer, anything, each of our athletes is still an individual in that team scenario. However, rowing and also kayaking is quite different because once you put uh, athletes into a boat, it only really works once you create crew harmony and synchronicity between each other. So it's about building a good solid athlete individually and then making also sure that they create and understand or they develop awareness as well as sort of feeling for their crewmates for the boat so the interaction internally in the boat is highly important but it does require quite a bit of off water uh, work as well um, okay and so let it start again i start with uh, some opinions of what a lot of coaches have sort of told me by coaching uh, young athletes what is important and this is for me also part of that topic so I just want to um, touch on a few points um, so when we bring athletes into the sport it's you know of course building culture creates good teams creates good crews club dynamics I mean you've heard a lot of that teaching balance not just balance inside the boat also balance out of the boat you know stress causes tension tension causes imbalance in the boat as well as outside of the boat so you can see that transference uh, between the actual um, social factor of the athletes the combination of athlete coaches but then also within the crew is, is quite unique what we bring here into rowing. Um, 
then that point of when you have young athletes trying to teach athletes to be physically and mentally strong, especially, uh, you know, that sport of rowing can actually be fantastic also for girls, because as we said with that ergometer, not everyone is maybe sort of strong and um, as they are all developed, especially women have quite weak upper bodies early um, or, you know, when they are still during puberty. So um, a sport like rowing can really help an athlete to grow as, you know, physically as well as mentally and um, uh, we can see that that girls especially um, come out very strong from that sport. Um, if we keep going, how to keep our athletes interested in rowing, I think is a very important point because it's a fine line of what can you do on the water? Can you keep all athletes interested because you bring different levels of expertise into the same boat? Some athletes maybe feel like they are not doing enough work in the boat while others can hardly make it through a training session so having that diversity and uh, of athletes on water and off water and keeping the interest uh, that's uh, a very interesting part of your coaching yeah um, so you have to keep it interesting for the athletes and um bring quite a lot of different ways of um, training plans or training sessions into it. Yeah? Um, we always have to keep in mind to keep young athletes interested are little comparisons, little team races. Um, they love that, you know, or changing team members. So things like that really just helps to grow the athlete but also your entire dynamics of the team um, I guess a big thing in rowing is um, to make our athletes understand what the sport of rowing requires on one hand it's a strength endurance sport which means you do need to spend a lot of time to work on your fitness however on the other hand it is a highly precise movement during the on-water rowing. Um, so that rowing stroke to be successful, to feel that you get gradually better technically and faster in the boat requires a lot of extra work such as stretching, mobilization and strengthening. All these things cannot only be done in the boat. As we said, in the boat, you're always as strong as the weakest link of um, within in the boat. And that's not sort of in a bad way. As I said, we need to make sure that athletes can also develop individually for their levels um, of the water. And um, this is where your part comes in. Um, I guess also with young athletes, um, we have to make sure that we avoid too long training sessions in their early development. Um, uh, injury uh, can come quicker when we overload young bodies. And um, I guess that's where um, rowing is um, quite fragile in some ways. If we get athletes into the program that haven't been exposed to a lot of other sports in their early life. You can really see a difference when athletes come from different types of sport into rowing. Their awareness to movement, to space is quite different. And um, when we think of a lot of uh, successful athletes, um, and I just, for example, could mention here um, from the Australian Awesome Force and um, for example, that uh, uh, Jimmy Tompkins used to be an uh, AFL player or that um, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the Andrew Cooper um, from the first awesome foursome boat in 92, he used to be able to do backflips. You know, sort of that athleticism that comes in from athletes from other sports is actually really helpful for rowing, yeah, um, or a 
Kim Crow was a hurdleist, got injured and came into rowing because she couldn't do her sport anymore. So there are a lot of interesting stories when athletes transfer into rowing, but also bringing athletes from, you know, sort of from school, school sport into rowing. I guess we have to make sure that we offer them a wide range of exercises, a wide range of, um, you know, sport or movement because it helps them to become stronger athletes. With that, um, we need to always keep in mind that uh, rowing during puberty um, changes a lot. And the good thing is also when we think of other sports like uh, figure skating or gymnastics, so anything in gymnastics, the athletes reach their peak quite early. So you often hear the stories that um, they, with their growth spurts, they suddenly can't do one of their exercises properly anymore. They have to relearn it. We often forget that this is exactly the same in rowing. Only because we are strength endurance sport doesn't mean our athletes having coordinative problems once a growth spurt comes in. Yeah, so we need to make sure that we keep that in mind. Yeah, it's not just um, pull hard and row long. It's really that fine tuning of technique. And the more we are a little bit multidimensional of in our approach of uh, teaching technique, um, the better athletes you get into the boat to become, you know, really efficient rowers. Um, also, we need to understand when these growth spurts uh, come in for our athletes. Um, I always like to remind our coaches, don't forget that especially the growth spurts come with a point that first your bone length becomes longer. That means at that time when the growth spurts comes in, the actual muscle is still the same length and has to catch up to the now longer bone. So it does take actually time to get the flexibility back. So it's highly important that in our growing phases that we emphasize flexibility, mobility a lot more with more so with the male athlete than with the female athletes because they tend to be um, much stiffer, much tighter in their uh, joints and, and their muscles. So if you are trying to create, you know, good technique, keep also the points of um, growing as a young athletes in mind and make sure that your off water work is suited to the age group you are working with. There's a lot to read. There's also a couple of things that um, here that um, comes from a physiotherapist and a doctor used to work with in Australia. They created these growing bodies. Um, and you can look at that up on the website as well. There's some fantastic information of these two scientists and um, um, uh, that physiotherapist who's, who works in, in different sports, um, they really sort of emphasized in these pathway programs that flexibility, movement control, and, and strength work really need to nurture each other. So we, so we make sure that our athletes are really able to um, progress while they are um, you know, developing physically, developing with age, and also developing in their sport. Yeah, so to come from an athlete into their specific sport now, which is rowing, obviously. Um, also saying that of what I just mentioned before, we have to make sure that um, with our young athletes um, in rowing, we, as, as I pointed out, if we do too much monotone work with our athletes or for example, over rig and make it too heavy for our athletes, 
injuries can occur quite quickly because their bodies are still quite fragile. Same thing as I said before, if bones work but muscles haven't caught up and the muscle actually really still need to build up for robustness um, until this is hasn't been developed enough and the the young backs of our athletes are quite fragile especially here again for women because um, they also have a um, a weaker muscle tonus, ton and they also have a, a weaker upper body um, naturally sort of built um, to, uh, to the male athletes. Um, but I definitely would um, recommend that you have a look at sort of these growing body concepts that um, these two um, scientists have put together and there are some nice sort of poster types you can get access to with some exercises so um, that's something uh, you can sort of try to get access to initial uh, um, additionally as well okay um i always love that picture and that also comes from um from kelly and and larry the two scientists I just mentioned. And we use it a lot to sort of show that combination of co that combination of coach, physio, and in this other way, also biomechanics. So I always love to say it as train your coach's eye. Um, we do know that in, um, in junior rowing, you often have these huge groups of athletes. So coaching and teaching your eye on a daily basis is sometimes actually also quite hard because you have logistically so many other things you need to look after safety getting your athletes going making groups row looking after three plus eights or fours or quads and so it's a lot happening for you but we still should spend a bit of time when we are on the water to really educate our eye. So if you look at that boat of the of the girls, you would sort of look at these postures and you think, oh, which one has that better technique? So if we um, look at um, the bow girl here, you would say, oh, she sort of slums forward quite a bit already. That girl sits a bit better. But once we actually put the the pelvis line in already then you can see the rock over of the bow girl is actually much better prepared than um than what the girl does here in the in the stroke seat so that pelvis never had the chance to rock over yeah to work through the stroke while that girl here can really push through the legs and then open the body. So we can actually see by just looking actually at the silhouettes of our rowers, sometimes if we haven't got enough time, we maybe see something that is different than what actually occurs internally in the rower's body. Okay, so this is just to show the complexity of what you are dealing with, you know, not just the number of athletes, but also how the technique actually um, occurs to us, yeah, and how they roll. Okay, um, if we continue that, then um, if you look at this sequencing movement pattern of a rower, then we would all agree this is what you see on a stroke by stroke basis. You in, in all these coaching um, presentations, you would hear so much about it from coaches, from different uh, scientists. Everyone talks about the technique um, when it comes to objective measurements, in, in this case, sort of biomechanical measures. If we want to name that this way, then obviously you can put an objective a number graph on top of what you visually see. Uh, this is then the combination of coaching and objective feedback. Feedback can be done as monitoring feedback or assessment. Um, and we can also use feedback 
in a way of finding exercises to help athletes to um, create some drills that will help them to become better in their technique. So once you understand of what you see versus the graphs that demonstrate in other ways what we can measure, then you can see a good link between the, in this case, force angle profile to the actual movement sequence of the rowing motion. Um, again, I did show that graph before in, in the talk before for the one who haven't seen it. Um, I always like to show the boat class comparison of the uh, collegiate rowers, of course. This is just an example, but in general, it does show you that between lightweight women, open women, lightweight men, up to heavyweight men's rowing, the overall force angle profile in these different crew scenarios looks, um, you could say in one way, it is a very, you know, normal force profile, but individually, you can see the variety of force profiles is very different. So when you come to always that question of what is the best force profile, this is um, often again, hard to answer with just one picture, because it's also depend in what boat you sit and what seat. So that's why often you instinctively or subconsciously you put athletes into different seats you know or that athlete you know is is has a really good rhythm and can pick up the the stroke quite well and is you know a bit stronger and solid so you would often put that athlete into stroke or six seat for example versus somebody who feels the rhythm and maybe um is not as quick of the legs. They often also fit well into the four seat. So force profiles, um, what we look for is of course that the athlete in general gets a lot of work done per stroke. Um, so that means you want to have as much area underneath the force um, angle profile but in general, there are different ways how you can sort of um, skin the cat here. Yeah? And there are different athletes who can um, bring a strong input into your boats. But um, what that graph also shows you, so it doesn't matter wh where your athletes fit into these um, boat classes. We can say it doesn't matter if it's um, beginner, school level, in this case, college level or up to senior athletes. What we will always see is that the smaller and lighter the athlete, the shorter they row, that makes total sense. They also have the lower um, force magnitude per stroke. And they also have a sort of flatter rate of force development at the beginning of the stroke. So everything takes a little longer and athletes in sort of that lower weight uh, categories also seem to be quite efficient in trying to maximize their loading throughout the entire stroke. When you go more to the men and then heavy men, you see they have the longest stroke lengths um, in general. They also have the, should have the highest power per stroke and they, um, they do have the, in most cases, the, the steepest rate of force development. But you can easily see you also have some athletes that actually um, miss quite a lot of force connection or force application early in the drive phase. And um, that is then a technical point that needs to be addressed for that athlete. 
Okay, so you can see that with the um, increase of weight and height, we get an increase of force, work, power and rate of force development and the length gets longer per stroke. Um, saying that, um, we do see again that technically crews start to row um, shorter once the rating goes above 30 than what they do in, in uh, rating um, their training rate of 20 approximately. And one reason for that is that again, that crew dynamics needs to work well, that athletes have a good preparation with each other to actually utilize the recovery phase properly to make it towards the catch. So, but coming to our topic, then um, going again, when you look at um, the development from schoolboys up to national team, what do we actually see? So you see um, that the biggest difference is that the magnitude of peak forces and average forces and power increases with the level of rower. But the reason for that is too that especially with our young athletes, that concept of getting a good coordination at the catch to get the connection of blade placement to leg push correctly done is a very uh, difficult concept and needs a lot of training. And this is why we can have already strong athletes, you know, in early years, but it does take time for them to get the right um, coordination happening and really utilizing the recovery phase properly that they actually can utilize their off-water strengths to uh, apply that into their on-water technique. And um, it's uh, always very obvious that it's highly difficult to utilize your leg drive properly in the boat early in your career because your blades are often flying to high legs start pushing we don't get anything of that initial leg push because nothing is really um, accelerating your hull until your blade is actually covered so the understanding of um, technique precision and utilizing your off water capacity is for me a very important thing. And that's what I always love to discuss with the, um, the coaches and also the athlete. So you will see that's exactly the same with the girls. And um, the other thing too, is you see also at the finish, again, finishes become in most cases stronger and better when the athletes start to become technically better. But the finish position is actually quite an unnatural position for a human being because we open up our hip angle quite widely and that means to be able to hold that position to finish off the strokes requires a strong core so to do that we need to do proper training um, of water. And when we say proper training, that also involves quite a bit of um, core and flexibility work and mobilization. I come to that in a second. So um, when you look at the women, you from schoolgirls up to national team, again, you can see that there is a problem A with the catch connection but also be in reaching lengths again that has something also to do with their bodies being initially not as strong so reaching forward is um, is not an, an easy concept sometimes for girls um, so we need to make sure quite early that our athletes understand movement joint rotation you know, flexibility. So all the work you want them to do off water, if they understand what it is for, it makes it easier for them 
to actually do the work before the on water um, development can really happen. Um, so, as I mentioned to you before, the crucial points for us in that um, in our rowing technique, when we come from successful all ideal, and this is always what a lot of coaches ask for, to the common technical breakdowns, the points where we really need to take more um, effort in and, and looking at that a bit more specifically is the way how I approach the coach, uh, the catch and also the finish. So if we look at um, our sort of athletes, in this case, I think everyone can see that's uh, Kim Crow. Um, she had also naturally the levers, okay? So some just have the flexibility and the long levers and the ratio between torso length and leg length and arm length, it's all fitting well. So, um, but you can see her catch position is just perfect here. If we compare that to an athlete um, more at the school level and also not a, a super tall athlete, then you can see that um, the catch here, it's also compressed, but it's a bit over compressed. But the, the big thing is here of what I said before, um, you know, when we look at developing athletes and look at the catch connection, so what we want to learn from the biomech, yeah, is, oh, there is a, a, a very long catch slip in this case, yeah, so the boat, uh, they move the handles uh, before actually the blades in the water. But if you look at the reason why that happens is, look how much lower the handles are to, for example, this case. So by coming to the catch, these blades are pretty much on the water line to catch. Here, the handles are much lower. So the blades are up in the air and it takes time until the blade is actually covered in the water. And that's why our data and objective measures show us how long it takes our athletes before the blade is fully locked. So the work of the legs is actually starts to uh, be able to apply to the boat and start to accelerate the boat. So you can see what happens is at the catch and then you just, um, all these points underneath don't just um, apply to one athlete, you know, everyone is slightly different. But as we see, poor ankle compression, hip, uh, poor hip compression, um, the, um, you know, poor pelvis and rock over all lead to less effective catch positions and so catch connections. Yeah. So it's very important that we do make sure that our athletes understand the preparation towards the catch. And here again, the ergometer is a great tool to actually show your athletes what a catch should look like. You know, make them feel, ah, oh, that's a position you want them to be in. This is something much harder to just do when they sit in the boat. Yeah, So you can work on the ergometer uh, much more individual in this case with your athlete. Um, so when you look at these profiles here, so you see here a, a senior, a international medalist, a scholar, in this case, a woman um, versus a school girl um, and you can see lots of loss around the catch leads to missing or missing leg drive so that leg drive started already we didn't we were not able to get all her leg drive because the blades were not locked into the water so that means that bit here which is a technical component in combination with often inflexibility leads to a loss of chance to reach a higher magnitude of um, 
peak force in this case, or rate of force development, because of the way the athlete is able to sit in the boat and is technically at that stage not able yet to coordinate blade placement to leg push properly. Yeah, so this is a fantastic way to see from where our beginning athletes start to where they can go once um, they are technically good and obviously also that athletes to really be able to bring uh, make it into the next levels. If you look underneath, that's now the same. I sort of demonstrate here two athletes, uh, international medalists in the sweep women's category. And beside us, you see two college girls from an eight. And uh, you can see again, missing catches lead to a big loss of initial rate of force development and giving away the chance that we actually utilize the leg drive. If you give technically your leg drive, uh, your catch away, we are not utilizing our legs. And this is the biggest loss um, of transition from an ERG to an, an on-water uh, performance. And when we ask why can some erg pullers not be as strong on the water, this is mostly that um, the way how they connect at the catch and how they push. So if they push into the boat and lift, that all creates too much movement for the boat and gets paid for with less um, speed. Yeah. Um, if we look at the same for the, the finish, then again, you see here a, a strong finish position of an um, international medalist. Yeah, so if you, and here you see a, a school boy in a sculling. So look at just the position of the finish, not just the posture also how he holds the handle, so the grip, it's uh, totally different. So again, it's fine tuning, yeah? We are not just looking at the big picture in rowing, you also need to look for the, the fine, uh, fine tuning things. If you are not having a good grip, it's very hard for our athletes to also finish off the stroke, yeah? To be able to really press out that uh, finish. So again, you see here the um, elite athlete being able to apply their, their force uh, and power through the stroke versus a schoolboy athlete, long finish slip here. And then when you go underneath, you see two athletes here, um, also medalists in sweep. And you see now, interestingly, two college rowers from a um, sweep program. And you can see there is a loss of catch and a huge loss of finish. Um, of course, these are not the strongest athletes um, that come in, but definitely technically, they give so much away already early that it's very hard for them to even finish the stroke off properly. So for the finishers, this is in most cases, the, the way of how the understanding has to be between coach and athlete of what do we need to do to activate our glutes properly, yeah? So when you come towards the finish of the stroke, if they activate the glutes, they can support the core better, can sit better, can hold the handles better. Um, yeah, but if you have a collapsed back, that means it A, takes you longer to get the blades out, but by sort of collapsing the, the back and also the hip means it takes you actually longer to come from the finish first up and then over to get out of the finish. And that takes a lot of time away from your boat to continue moving. So bad posture by a lack of 
core strengths and technique of supporting the posture you need at the finish um, really costs boat speed. And these are things, if our athletes get that ingrained early in their development, you will actually notice that it will help your boat in a crew scenario, A, to sort of keep that natural speed going much quicker. And, um, and the timing of the back, if they hold the finish better, yeah, and understand what a good um, finish position needs to be, um, makes that timing between each other better. They can release the blades easier and they put every stroke less load on the back. So also by rowing technically better um, means that they, um, um, there is less injury in your, in your training group, yeah? Or the risk of less injury. So again, the, the, when we think of, of strength and conditioning and biomechanics, what you see here is not that I give you a, you know, a training plan. That's you have uh, strength and conditioning people here. What I want to, you to make to understand is that the information I can get objectively of athletes often can assist coaches and your support team who maybe does your strengths in conditioning programming to understand what type of athletes you have and where the requirements lie for your group to um, sort of build a robust a dynamic and also sort of versatile program for your athlete so they are able to um, develop individually and to become that better athlete and to then be able to actually do the on water work, which we said before, requires a lot of endurance work, but for endurance, you need a body that is capable to a last throughout the training session, last the load that is required for the repetitive stroke motion and lasts in technically from a low stroke rate then up to the higher racing stroke rate. So I have here three, um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I have here three examples for you. So for example, the early catch opening so that I can see and we talked about it before. So that's how I would highlight something to, to the coach to say here that I see a technical, um, a mistake here that the athlete is making. Have you thought of, as we said, you know, work on flexibility, understanding of suspension, uh, understanding of um, catch connection coordination? What can we do to create good exercises for our athletes to then help them to build this rowing motion? easier for them. Um, the, an interesting thing I definitely want to show you is that um, we see not just in the uh, beginners level and um, a pathway athletes level, we also see that in the elite level, the change of technique when stroke race uh, stroke rate increases. So for example, if you have an athlete that has already um, technical little tweaks and issues at the low rating of stroke rate 20. In this case, you know, a delayed catch. And that was also something in the sweep boat where the athlete rose uh, actually long enough here. So catch angle is long, but by the time he is at the, he or she is at the catch, um, the, um, legs start moving before the blade is placed. That's this indication here. Um, then what I see here, but not drastically in stroke rate 20 is that the rate of force development is sort of quite a bit slow with a quite delayed peak force in that sweep boat. And then um, 
but that's for me an indication that the athlete would go a bit vertically up so there is a movement upwards of the body and the shoulders so uh, what that means is in stroke rate 20 it's not that apparent however once we go into the higher rating you can see that the technique now breaks more apart um, that means that um, it's for the athlete even harder to keep that stroke pattern or the sequencing of leg drive, body motion, arm draw in the same sequence. It's much harder than once the rating comes up and the technical little appearance that, that uh, came up already now become really obvious. Yeah. So, and you see if an athlete misses a catch, then subconsciously they often try to overcome it with a bit more vertical upper body work. Often the shoulders move up as well. But unfortunately, whatever we move up has to come down in the boat. And this is where often these athletes have also then this inefficient or ineffective uh, finish angles and uh, these finish slips. So what it means is when they brought everything up to come to the finish, all that weight then often comes down onto the seat. And that means you've, you collapse your, your back and your hip, as we mentioned in that uh, slide before. So, and there is not just the collapsing of the body with a weaker finish connection. So the blade would then pop out as well and too early. Um, but the worst thing is in that combination is that at that finish, the weight actually would really push the boat down. So there is a double effect of where technique actually falls apart a bit early, but you also pay for it at the end of your dry phase or at the end of your work. Yeah, in that stroke. So we can really see you're not just paying for your little slight technical um, issue early in that part where it happens. So the cause and then where the effect happens, it's actually dragging on. So again, coming back to that gymnastics um, uh, example, you know, also rowing is like gymnastics on the water. We need to be quite precise in our approach of rowing technically well. We often think we can get away with that uh, because of rowing is a strength endurance sport. In certain points, yes, too, uh, you can, but when competition becomes tighter and tighter, then you will see that this is a, um, you get caught at one stage, especially when the water gets bad. And we know that happens often. However, um, I think it is good for you to just quickly see what actually happens at the, at the beginner's level or school level. And I try to be a bit quick here because we are running out of time. So, um, here is the junior men's coxed quad. You see four athletes and um, four different types of profiles. Of course, you try to create that one unique crew style, but as we mentioned before, it's quite different um, in the execution of the way your athletes are rowing. You see there's only really one who is able to connect with the uh, uh, with the catch a bit more properly. Interestingly, you see here an athlete that has a huge difference between right and left force application. When you actually see what's happening is that is was the strongest scholar of that squad also on the water. And, um, but once put in the team boat, um, he gets put in the stroke as we often do that because you know he has a good boat feel and understanding. But once he's in the boat, he also gets caught balancing the boat. So what we see actually here in that crew scenario for him is a reaction of what's happening in the boat. So again, 
this is a, a, a big thing for you to keep in mind uh, that um, good technique is important because we need to give our athletes in this boat also chances to actually row proactively. So you give them the workload so the boat can just run and not like this particular athlete who has a training session where he constantly on a stroke by stroke basis has to balance that boat all the time. So that athlete, for example, um, benefits for also sometimes having rowed in a, in a smaller boat or do that individual off water work because this, what he does here in this case, is quite a reactive way of his, um, of his stroke profile, yeah? So he would never row like that in a single, yeah? That's, um, it's a typical um, crew um, response that can happen. Um, then you see here in a uh, women's squad, you also see the ranges yeah, between one of your best rowers to one of your very early beginners. So, you know, there, there is a lot that's happening here for you. Um, then when we would go into women's eight under 19, you can see again, what I said to you before, you coach one technique, you give them advice as a crew, but the execution can be quite different between your athletes. But in general, you see most um, problems occur around the catch or at the finish. Yeah, so I just highlighted some of them. Yeah, and finish is really, as we said, it's that ability of core strengths and you need uh, and the athletes need to understand they need to work on it. Yes, yeah? the same for the men. So you can look at these examples on your own a little bit. Um, um, another thing that um, I always like to show as a graph, and unfortunately I can't sort of not replicate that anymore in a better color, is that we do need to understand what, what our young athletes are doing throughout the session. So um, they start off with, you know, obviously not the most um, effective technique initially at the early part of their, their training session, but if they just have, a, and that's a woman, is that a, a weak torso and um, a weak back, then uh, with, a, you know, a less effective technique where you can really see that is leg and body works very early and then the body is already too far through in the mid stroke and then just the arms come by the end of the session the separation of legs body versus arms has really collapsed and this is when injuries can occur yeah so it is important that when you have weaker athletes um make sure you don't over rig them because if they if they look like they just uh, reach the end of the training session sometimes you have to make sure that they um, you know don't get injured um, some just can't hold that load throughout an entire session but as we said in that example with the women's court before you have that range of athletes who can you know, totally row at that wide range versus a beginner. So where do you match your, your setup for the boat? I know that is very hard. So it's always very important of um, making sure you build your bricks or you have all the bricks available to build good technique. I always like that um, presentation from Steve Gunn. Um, I think it really shows that, um, good technique um, is a comprehensive um, sort of multi-dynamic um, multi um, build of, of, you know, flexibility, strength, endurance, awareness, harmony. So all the things you have to build. So it, it become, can become quite an interesting um, um, 
training you can put together for your athletes. So again, coming back to what I think is highly important and you need to put in for your athletes are these exercises that will really assist them to build that body um, to be ready for good rowing. And this is stretching the hip flexors. Um, you also have to make sure they really stretch the glutes after every session. Um, this is again, you know, to have strong finishes, to be able to do the rock over. Rock rover is important to be able to be ready for the next catch. So again, all that exercises we are looking at here now is highly important to be able to reach the positions that are required for good technical rowing hamstrings uh, flexibility again um, we always sort of see weak finishes but we cannot overcome weak finishes if our athletes haven't got that range in their muscles to sit properly and hold the load of the handles yeah so it's um we do need to go through this you know daily exercises like cleaning teeth every day um strong uh, trunk strength and endurance yeah we need to work on our core i mean building a body like that to being able to hold that rowing load this is not something you you know you can do in 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 a couple of years it does take time um so but with our early athlete or young athletes it is important that we say you need to work first on movement to then work on the muscles. So I always like the saying of you must have the physical to do the technical. And if you can do the technical, then you can do the tactical. So if you think of that race, yeah, if our athletes, athletes are physically fit and robust, you can create with them very technical rowers, good boat movers, and then you go into a race and then you can actually make moves and be tactical because they've got all sort of their little things around them ready to be able to act and react and, you know, put 10 strokes in and the crew can react to it and they can stay in harmony. So it's you know, a lot of learnings from that is that strength conditioning is not just building muscles. We need the range in rowing. What we have really seen over the years is that we, um, when we started to try to create more powerful athletes, they actually became so compact, so tight in their in their. Um, legs and also in their hips that they lost a lot of range so they needed to try to get stronger because they couldn't reach the catch uh, the catch uh, length and catch position anymore so our muscles need to be long and lean and they need to be dynamic and dynamic needs range so for me that is highly important that we build that already with athletes Okay, so, and um, uh, I try to finish off here. So the, the important thing is that we understand that every athlete will come in if we would measure them with a profile that once they go up to a certain rate, I will always find an area where the body will give in a bit. This is not a, a failure or a weakness of the athlete. This actually shows us where the athlete has potential to um, sort of be a bit more aware what to focus on, to understand what is my strengths within that rowing motion, where do I need to work on? So the objective feedback is actually very helpful also in early age to assist coaches to work with the athlete on, um, you know, on, on good effective technique, but it's also there to learn. It should not be 
there to always assess to sort of say okay you're not doing that right you're not doing that right for me it's important to find areas of opportunities for athletes to understand where that next step is possible so um chris would you like to check if there are any questions uh, i think there was um let's see here there was I had a German math teacher in grade school who told me that she could tell the difference between an American and a German simply by watching them walk, never hearing them even speak a word or speaking a word. I'm wondering if it is an overgeneralization to observe that Americans walk less on a daily basis for transportation and how to how that may impact core, torso, hip stabilization, strength, and also flexibility, which could impact the slow finish syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I definitely believe that um, the more um, active people are and, and the more different activities they do, they, the more efficient and graceful they are in their movement. And because they stay active, as I just said before, is the, the range of movements has a much better lightness. And I think Josie would be also a good one to comment on this one. Um, you know, there's always that big um, belief that the, the Dutch people, they cycle everywhere and that's why they have such a good endurance and they that's why they get a lot of good uh, rowers quite late at that stage. Yes, yeah, so they, they seem to bring the athletes much later into the sports. However, they had exposure to so many other sports initially. So um, I haven't heard that before, but in general, I would totally uh, agree to say that um, any person moving, you know, a lot um, will always... Um, be able to pick, um, you know, uh, coordination and, and just sort of the, the, the fine tuning of movements up so much easier. Yeah, definitely believe that. And also so that heaviness, lightness, yeah, of movement. I, I really like how throughout the, the presentation, you kept bringing it back to the younger and then in the more novice athletes, um, particularly, you know, one of the spots that I think is really worth repeating is watching out because as coaches we say hey we're gonna you know here's our practice time we're gonna go 70 minutes you know 80 minutes and then with we're fixated on getting to the end of practice but we've got to be in touch with you know when the athlete is running out of steam because that is there is a correlation to those injuries um and that's where their bodies are going to let down and, and maybe increase the 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 chance of an injury so i think sometimes we want to finish practice or we want to finish you know, what we're doing. And I, we just have to be in tune with the athlete and with the moment. Um, this has been great for the whole American developmental, uh, the development movement too, or model. Um, so it's really great. Thank you so much. Are, are there other questions out in the crowd? Anybody? Well, um, thank you so much, Connie, for doing this. And uh, these will be available on the sketch.com website. So when you go in there next to her, there will be a little icon that you can click and download it. So these are yours to go through. There's a lot of good nuggets in here that I think you can go through this two or three times and watch it and, and uh, search through the presentation and, and grab a lot of so much great detail on the finer points. Um, you know, because those finer points are where they're going to break, right? So those are the things that we can fix. And I also, I, 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 what you ended with was, these aren't failures. These are opportunities for where these athletes can improve. And, I, you know, I think there's a mindset there that in America, you'd have, you're, you win or you lose or you fail. If we can be more positive with the kids, especially the younger ones, that this is a continuous this is a journey, right? Where there is no destination. This is a journey for improvement constantly. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Connie. It, it's, it's great seeing you and say hello to the family. And uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, 
in that presentation, I could have gone on for, <laughs> for another hour. So there will be a few more slides, but I'm pretty sure they make sense. Um, so thanks for listening in. And um, I hope you got something out of it. And um, I think it's important that we, um, especially when we work with developing athletes, I think it's it's fantastic, you know, this, this idea of they want to race, but they also still develop, they still have their playing mind, uh, you know, so there is so much opportunity of building the athlete for initial, uh, in the end of, you know, building great fast boats, but that in between, um, I think it doesn't matter um, what they do, as long as our athletes, you know, stay fit and develop their strengths by actually moving and keeping their bodies, you know, flexible and agile and springy. You know, it's as, as you said in that one comment, we don't want to have this heaviness in our movement. We want lightness because the rowing motion should look, look efficient and it should sound like music when the boat moves. So music is light and that's how, and that fluidity should also be represented in their rowing motion. Thank you. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so, I mean, the more we move away from specialization and the more we move towards building athletes and athleticism, you know, the fundamental movement patterns and stuff. So, well, thank you again so much and um, uh, stay safe. Stay, stay safe, what, west coast of Canada, yeah? Stay yeah, safe. And here on the island, <laughs> it's safe. It's full with snow, so we are, we can't do much. <laughs> so, except go skiing and go outside. That's all good. That's perfect. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.